Uh, th this is our first, maybe last, but well, we hope not, our first Ignite event. Uh, and the, the ground rules are 20 slides, 15 seconds, and lots of wit and wisdom ensuing. And uh, there, there will be a discussion uh, afterwards, so take copious notes during the presentations. And <clears throat> um, the, the first up in alphabetical order is Dennis Dorden, Associate Dean of Research, Scholarship, and Creative Work in the School of Architecture and Professor of Architecture and Design. Dennis is an architectural and design historian, museum consultant, and co-editor of Design Issues, 20th Century Architecture and Design, including political themes in architecture, the impact of new materials, and the evolution of exhibition design techniques. So please welcome Dennis Dorden. This was, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do this, good afternoon. It's also quite a bit of a challenge. It forces you to find the visual equivalent of short declarative sentences. What I want to do is present uh, an article, a chapter in a book, the argument there that I turned in this summer. Uh, the book is a handbook on sustainable design, and I was asked to write the chapter on theories of sustainable design, how we conceptualize and think about this. And I want to then segue into a discussion of Europe as both a model and as a laboratory for some of these ideas. We all know what the problem is. We're trashing the planet. But it's a very wicked problem in terms of there are multiple variables. It's hard to quantify all the variables. It's very difficult to predict outcomes. And things are, are interconnected in a variety of ways. So in this essay, I was looking at different ways of thinking about this. The scientific technical one, and this is an example of a model that's called planetary boundaries, where scientists identify nine crucial subsystems and the legitimate boundaries, and in three of those argue we've already transcended those boundaries. So the effort there is to use a scientific technological approach to manage the flow of matter and energy through the environment in a more sensitive and efficient manner. It relies on things like life cycle analysis, and you can begin to compl complicate those life cycle analysis with things like cradle to, to cradle analyses, which have materials leaving the natural environment going through the technosphere and either being recycled in the technosphere or returning to the natural environment in a harmless, inert manner. It leads to projects like this, the Pearl River Tower in Guangzhou, China. The architects claim that this is what's called a net zero building. That is, it generates as much energy as it consumes, arriving at a net zero effect. The criticism of the scientific technical approach is that it puts blinders on. It uses and relies on science and technology to solve problems that science and technology has already created. And so the idea is that you're locked into basically the problem that is that the, this worldview that's driving that problem. The alternative way is to conceptualize well-being. And I'm using this image, uh, two generations, healthy, happy, enjoying the bounty of the earth outdoors as the beginning of a model for well-being. The whole concept of well-being is actually fairly well conceptualized these days. And the challenge is, if, if well-being is the goal, and we want to get there, how do we get from where we are now to that state of well-being? That is, what is the transition of this? And here's where I want to start to use Europe as the model. Here's Europe, the, geogra the geographical map, the mountains, the rivers, the plains. We tend to think of this as fixed, permanent, natural Europe. It changes so slowly as to be relatively unimportant in, in terms of the scheme of things. This is designed Europe in contrast to natural Europe. We've drawn lines on the map, and those lines define nations. Those lines define people as members of a nation. And <clears throat> what you have to realize is that this is a work of artifice and subject to change. Unfortunately, I can make the following statement. I'm old enough that for most of my life, there was one country called Czechoslovakia and two countries called Germany. And we know now how that has changed. But it opens up this idea that Europe is filled with models and experiments. This is the flag of the Republic of Salo, which was the final effort of Mussolini to create a political entity in northern Italy. It represents one of these uh, luckily failed attempts. But Europe, he in history, then becomes filled with these models. Utopian visions, this is 1919, the German expressionist architect Bruno Taut, who imagined a new form of social community by people of Europe working together to literally carve the Alps into diamond-faceted forms. The Euro as another example of trying to imagine a different way 
to, uh, to configure the relationships among states and among people and a different basis for thinking about that. And it leads, hopefully, to ephemeral events. There are real events, there are visionary utopian events, ephemeral events like the London 2012 Olympics. I was in the UK a couple of weeks ago and it's fascinating how much reflection is going on there about the impact of the Olympics and why it worked. And there's the, the, the way it's discussed is that there was a coming together of a variety of social energies and forces, from the state trying to meet very strict deadlines to get this event finished, to individual accomplishment, really a celebration of individual accomplishment, but a social solidarity around this ephemeral event. There are people who think about transition theories and try to map the way these various isolated, seemingly isolated and ephemeral events congregate together to create larger new forms of consciousness that can perhaps promote the transition to a society based on well-being. So that the, in the end, I wind up arguing there's two ways to approach it, the scientific, technical, and the uh, issue of well-being. And the key is theories of transition. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, next is Ian Kite, professor of anthropology. He has published on a range of issues related to human history and archaeology. Since 2006, he has directed the cultural landscapes of the Irish Coast Project, an interdisciplinary study focused on documenting social and economic reorganization of 18th through 20th century island life and the spread of early Christianity across western coastal areas of Ireland through the fifth and twelfth, through fifth through the twelfth centuries. So, Ian Kite. I think I have to press this button. There we go. Uh, I want to do a couple things today for you. First of all, I want to talk about how individuals can issue and create change in different ways, and I want to contextualize that in terms of immigration from Ireland. And I want to do this in the context of one particular individual, the life of one individual, who I thought was going to show up here any second here, but apparently doesn't want to for us. There we are, decided to show up. So this is the individual. This is James Took. And he's an individual who was born in the 1830s, and he, uh, sorry, the 18, 1810s. And he's an individual from a Quaker family who comes after living for a fairly plain life in many ways, he comes across and he witnesses the famine. He travels, he writes a treatise on it, which is an analysis of it called Visit to Connick. And as part of that, he underlines the humanitarian aspect to this. And he takes it away from a legal argument of poverty and criminalization to one of that their government needs to extend itself and involve itself in humanitarian issues. So let's fast forward from the initial famine to what's known as the hidden famine. And that is that there's a major crisis in 1879-1880 where uh, there was another famine, both one of kelp failure, fishing failure, uh, as well as plants. And it took place largely in the West. It's largely under-recognized, hugely under-recognized. So he goes, he witnesses this, he travels there, and he comes back and writes another volume, a very persuasive volume where he talks about this as an economic problem, as a humanitarian problem that requires all kinds of analysis and requires people to think about it from the standpoint of, um, of economics and how you'd redistribute things. And this is bouncing all over the place. Interesting. So he then travels to North America. He goes to a number of different places. <laughs> He travels to North America, goes to a number of different places uh, as part of this to basically find a framework where he can create immigration, have people immigrate to North America to take them out of that Irish context. Uh, he does it. He goes traveling by himself to Minnesota, Manitoba, Kentucky, all over the place to look for places where he can move these populations into Ireland. And I think I'm just going to press that button <laughs> since there we go. He then goes back. Um, and he creates the context for fundraising. He goes and through this individual, the Duke of, Bread, of Bedford, he has a meeting of the Society of Friends, which are largely MPs who create the money in the space of one afternoon. They create the money and they turn the whole thing over to him. And he goes and he puts together 
basically an outline of what they will do, including the cost is going to be covered by the relief organization. They want to move 10,000 people to North America. He actually has dreams of 60,000, by the way. And they're going to do it in such a way where they cover the cost. He does this very, very quickly. In March, he's immediately within seven days. He goes from London. By June, he's moved 1,200 people to North America. This is only 1882. Eight by, by three years from there, he's moved 10,000 people. He does this in such a way where he interviews people for 10 hours a day in Clifton. He accepts one out of every six couples that come in. And he sends them with some choice to different towns. Most of these are not Boston or New York. They're out in the highlands in different places. He goes into Clifton and various other towns. He opens up his pocketbook. He overcomes an awful lot of local opposition. He provides housing, clothing, food for everybody that's there that, that, that basically is selected for this. He then moves them from Clifton all the way to Galway. And he does it in such a way where he hires boats. He hires anything, any means, including walking, to get these people over to Galway. They show up in Galway. They're provided at that point with food. They're provided with clothing, with a new suit. They're given vouchers to go in and buy new suits. They're accommodated. And then he goes, uh, he, in advance, he's gone, and he set it up in such a way where they, he's bought in 400, uh, upwards of 400 tickets for these people to go across. They then go across, and they, of course, see things coming from this kind of cultural context. They go to Boston or Montreal. They travel by train. They are accompanied by Quakers who basically take them across. And they travel seeing things they've never seen before. They come out of Boston, and they come out of Montreal, and they go to a whole bunch of different places, largely rural, agricultural in focus. And they go in and create their own worlds. I'm not saying all the Irish created all the saloons in North America, but you get the picture. How much of this, how big is the scale? It's enormous. It's, if you calculate it out, it's almost 800,000 people in US standards today. Take out Alaska, North Dakota, South Dakota. That's the number of people that were moved in that very short period of time. What does this tell us in terms of history? I think it's fascinating. He essentially establishes this moral and ethical framework for relief. He changes how things are done. And he does it in such a way where it's 66 years before the United Nation and the formalization of various relief organizations. Very, very interesting man. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Next, we have Alison Rice, Associate Professor of French. She specializes in 20th and 21st century Francophone literature. Her current book project, inspired by her series of filmed interviews she conducted in Paris, which I think we might see some fragments of today, explores the present proliferation of women writers in French from around the world. So please welcome Alison. Through a series of interviews I conducted with women writers of French from around the world, I became aware of a unique phenomenon. Immigrants and minorities in France, and perhaps elsewhere in Europe, identify themselves with the city in which they live and with the continent. This is Julia Kosteva at the University of Paris 7. She declares that the capital is unique, that it is, quote, the place where I am really rooted in France, Paris, which is an island inside the hexagon. Paris is not the whole of France. It's thanks to Paris that I have become what I am. I consider myself a French woman, of French nationality, but a European citizen of Bulgarian descent and American adoption. Brina Svit's identity is also multifaceted. I am Slovenian, but I live in Paris and I write in French. It's funny to have to say three phrases to identify myself. I couldn't say that I feel French because that isn't true, but I do feel Parisian. Algerian-born Zaya Ramani has lived in France since the age of six. While her childhood was spent in a small town in the north, she now believes Paris is the only city where she can live in France. Others, like Chadort Javan, were smitten with Paris long before they arrived. I already knew Paris when I was in Iran, through books. I had imagined Paris and fantasized a great deal about Paris. In my mind, there wasn't 
France. There was only Paris. Indian-born Sumana Sinha's autobiographical novel contains multiple mentions of Paris as a city of Europe. France is seldom evoked. It is as if, for this writer mesmerized by the city of light, there were nothing but a constellation of great cities of Europe. Natasha Apana also says she loves Paris. She dreamed of coming to this magnificent city when she was in her native Mauritius, and the Seine was the stuff of postcards. But she hasn't asked for French citizenship. She doesn't want to do so simply to obtain papers. Some are less enamored, but nonetheless compelled to inhabit Paris. Hélène Sixou asserts that if she lives in Paris, it is for cultural and intellectual reasons. It's not because she's a Parisian at heart. Like Sixou, Bessora prefers to live near the edge of Paris. When asked if she's a Parisian, Bessora says that it is a mask that she's capable of wearing. Born in Belgium to a Swiss mother and a Gabonese father, she does not have French citizenship. Fatou Diom was denied French citizenship six times until her first novel became a bestseller, and then it was granted. The novel sheds light on African immigration, and Diom indicates that it is not one particular country, but Europe as a whole that represents a better life for immigrants. It is worth noting that Diom does not live in Paris, but Strasbourg, an important city for Europe as well as for Diom's identity. It is also significant that when I met with her, she was in residence at a place devoted to welcoming European writers. Nina Bouhawi grew up between France and Algeria, the respective homelands of her mother and father, and she depicts this upbringing in Tomboy. Near the novel's close, the principal protagonist flees to Rome, a European capital that represents a third space for a troubled adolescent. Rome, my city, my new city. I, become happy in Rome. I became happy in Rome. My body revealed something new, an evidence, a different personality, a gift perhaps. I came from myself and myself alone. In her autobiographical Moreno, Brina's fit is in a writer's residence in Italy when Le Pen advances to the second round of the presidential elections. The narrator asserts, I feel French for the first time in my life. I cannot simply live in Paris and act as if this vote didn't concern me. Marine Diaz, born in France to a French mother and an absent African father, left her native country for Berlin when Sarkozy was elected president. The winner of the Prix Goncourt has been criticized for this move, but she is firmly attached to the new location. Diaz doesn't identify herself with Africa, since she hardly knew her father. But Franco-Cameroonian author Leonora Miano is attentive to a community dubbed Afropean, defined in her work as European of African ascendancy. This designation recalls a similar concept, Afro-Parisianism, found in Black Paris. Both terms point to urban European identities, characterized by a cosmopolitan openness that I, like Kristeva, hope to see develop further in the future. Donc, euh, cette, ce Paris-là m'a accueilli et, et sans cette ouverture, euh, je pense que ce que j'ai fait depuis n'aurait pas pu avoir lieu. Et je sais que quand je vais maintenant aux États-Unis, je suis considérée comme quelqu'un qui représente euh, cette ouverture cosmopolite euh, de la ville de Paris, sinon de toute la France, mais que j'espère pouvoir euh, euh, être un jour euh, euh, la France elle-même. And that is it. Thank you. <laughs> souls to come up and let's see I don't know if I have do I have my own mic
and this concept of European identity towards that they seem to be embracing and towards which we maybe are moving? Yes, I think that might be one way to see it. Um, in the particular French context, but also in other countries, of course, we do have rising nationalisms, and that's something that uh, Julia Kristeva mentioned in this following continuation of her of her sentence that was cut off there uh, but uh, but there is something about uh, these individuals who immediately are saying I am I feel Parisian I am Parisian uh, declaring this identification as uh, someone who lives in this city who belongs to this city in a certain sense but really no sense of identification with the country and never anyone saying I feel French and I love France it's I love Paris as very particular and of course I was interviewing most of these women in Paris uh, but I find that it's also interesting because we have uh, a real identification with other major cities in Europe so I can easily move to Berlin and feel very comfortable there I can easily go to Rome and feel very comfortable there uh, and I cannot uh, uh, feel comfortable in another city in France in the same way uh, perhaps in smaller cities especially but of course there is Fatou Diom who's in Strasbourg and that's very important for her so so I do think it's just just uh, this phenomenon I noticed, and then I notice in books we have uh, uh, quite a few mentions of these cities, and uh, and really people feeling very, very comfortable with that sort of self-identification, uh, whereas nat national identifications just just absent from the books and absent from their personal comments as well. I was just going to ask, actually, uh, a follow-up to that, and that is the, the question of how would they be viewed by writers outside of Paris? Would they be viewed as Parisian? Would they be viewed as French? Because the, it's the same thing in so many different ways, the issue of self-identification and how they're viewed. So could you elaborate on that? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a good question. Um, in, uh, in the French context, of course, uh, there are very, very strong regional identifications and sometimes a rejection of uh, what might be seen as someone who is uh, uh, trop parisien, uh, too Parisian. Or, uh, but what we have with these writers is uh, their exotic nature for many of them or their otherness that is uh, part of uh, where they come from, as you mentioned, Patrick, uh, this other identification that is very strong. And so they're not seen as Germanopratine or something like that, you know, belonging to the 6th arrondissement of Paris and being the uppity Parisian. Uh, so I think that they are identified with the city in a sense by other readers, perhaps other French readers, but not so much. They're going to see more of a, oh, this is an Indian in Paris, as that cover showed uh, for this new young writer, um, uh, Sumana Sinha, who's from India, and so when they see an Indian in Paris, it's that exotic nature that those who are outside Paris, for instance, might be drawn to, oh, what's it like for, a, for an Indian to be in France in general, but in Paris in particular, and of course there's always been sort of a Paris and the rest uh, dynamic in France, and Paris is so different from the rest of France that it's, it's, it's divided into Paris et Provence, and you're either, uh, Provence, sorry, and you're either from Provence or you're from Paris, and every Everyone sort of moves towards Paris, and many speak other languages. You know, we ignore that fact sometimes, but uh, but there are other languages and dialects, and of course, accents are even discriminated and distinguished in France uh, in such a way that uh, that it's also a move for anybody to go to Paris if you're from the south of France or from elsewhere. And in fact, in the French language, we say "monter à Paris" because it's this idea of going up, even if you're from the north of France, coming down. It's uh, you know, it's it's a different country in a sense, and so Paris is quite unique so but I think it's quite interesting that someone like Fatou Diom has not gone to Paris whereas all of these other women I, I interviewed have and and of course there are the the publishing issues and all of that and and Fatou Diom must go to Paris in order to publish but this very conscious decision to remain in Strasbourg even though she's encountered difficulties there are a lot of prejudice that she might not have encountered in the larger more cosmopolitan Paris Uh, you know, on your map, there appeared to be a contingent in the South Bend area, and I wondered if uh, it's possible to identify any of those descendants, or did they just become completely assimilated? 
No, they didn't become completely assimilated, to, to use that framing. Uh, there's actually a very interesting web page that a local individual by the name of Daly, I believe, has out where she uh, tracks her descendants as part of the famine and, and uh, the later famine uh, into South Bend and different spots. Uh, in fact, there were distinct neighborhoods south of, of, south of where we are that were very clearly Irish. So, no, there's very much. That, that's being obscured, and, you know, as time goes on, that's being washed away, the, those kinds of uh, sort of ethnic marking in terms of the landscape. And, and it's also probably something that is morphing and uh, being uh, trans transformed intergenerationally to a point where, you know, those issues of family identity and heritage are less important, or it gets transferred to the fighting Irish of Notre Dame. It's sort of gets morphed in that, that kind of framework rather than something else. So yeah, there are still distinct neighborhoods. One of the other ones, I, I didn't put it up, but there's um, a sort of a, a great little cocktail piece of trivia that's associated with this. And that is, if you think of any particular state and think of the highest concentration of, of Irish individuals, Irish names, it turns out that it's Montana. And in fact, there's a few towns, mining towns, and it's from this kind of migration. So what's really cool about this, uh, this view and, and this particular uh, work of, of Took is that it, it left a signature on the landscape that we can see in terms of concentrations in some of these locations that are, that are even visible today. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, I think it was a bomb. I think it was a, a, essentially an immigration bomb. Many people have argued uh, for the, the 1847 famine that the, that the famine is essentially over. They view it as a demographic event that was very painful, very emotional. Uh, the flip side of that demographic event is one of that we have labor rising in the new world, the phoenix arising that creates the context of modern of, of society today. I. I take a much longer perspective on that, and I would argue that in many ways the famine is not over. What we're seeing is still uh, huge reorganizations on a local level to those kinds of issues, to those people that did leave. So I would argue that the kind of social reorganization, the family reorganizations, uh, those kinds of things take much longer than the kind of legal settlement of, of who's a landlord, who's in certain piece of territory, those kinds of issues. So I. I think the departure of that number of people left a, a, a huge, um, a huge hole, and I, I don't think people have really wrestled with it in terms of what that means, what immigration means in terms of issues of kinship, issues of identity, uh, and then some of those other aspects of guilt, of of having somehow come to North America and having survived. Uh, it's the famine is something. And, and the sort of immigration that resulted from it is something that is much a, a psychological process than it is anything else. So I, I think it had a huge impact. As I was listening to Allison, I thought that it was a wonderful example of one of the things I was trying to say, which is that Europe is this incredible laboratory of efforts to imagine different ways of organizing, either personal identity or group identity. I'm not sure I would say, I would use the word casualty. What's happening is identity is much more uh, malleable, and people choose or build an identity that is separate from the identity that, that drawing lines on the map would suggest. That, to me, is an example of, of something that in, in my chapter I call disciplined imagination as a way to imagine an alternative future. That the, uh, the techno-scientific model is about modeling. Theory drives you towards modeling the behavior of systems. 
but the alternative into well-being calls for disciplined imagination, and I think that's at part of what she's describing, is people exercising that. So I think it's another example of Europe offering people in my field who are trying to think about how we get from A to B, how we actually change things. Examples of people doing just that. Well, it's interesting. I really wanted to focus on women because I saw this as a very new phenomenon, particularly we have, uh, you know, waves of African writers in Paris in the 30s, in the 40s, but no women are a part of uh, that group. And it was very difficult because of traditional societies in Africa, for instance, for women to get an education and to be able to write. Uh, and so, so we really only have post-colonial African women writers uh, beginning in the 1970s. And certainly, if you take someone like Fatou Diom, uh, she's aware of that, you know, of those forebears, of those uh, predecessors who are women. She's also very aware of men, but she won't cite uh, much earlier than uh, just the preceding generation, really, uh, of men even. Usman Semben is a major, uh, a major uh, inspiration to her uh, and someone she's worked on also in an academic context. But, uh, but no, we don't see this as a continuum at all, I would say. It's really a new wave and people coming in and uh, and uh, and the just the way that it's no longer just post-colonial. I mean, I interviewed a, a South Korean woman. I interviewed a Japanese woman. And, and we have really global women writing in French now. But I do think they owe a lot to the feminists in France. And I do see some very interesting things there. And it's not an accident that I interviewed Julia Kristeva and Hélène Sixou, who are considered around the world to be French feminist theorists without anyone problematizing those words. And all of those words need to be problematized. They are neither simply French nor feminists, if you ask them, uh, and maybe not even theorists. So, so all of that uh, is very complex and much more complex than, than we've thought. But those are sort of an older generation. And then we've got very young writers coming in. And so, so it's a good question, but I don't see it as a continuum, uh, actually. Thank you. I, I have a question for Ian. You talked about Tuke and a scouting trip to the US. and. Uh, it seems that the effort was to move the uh, immigrants onto the land, not into cities. Was that because his vision of what was in their best interest, in other words, the, a better life, better welfare for them, was still tied to a concept of land, of being on the land? It, it was. It was both tied to the concept of on the land, um, but the other part to it was sort of the humanitarian aspect to it, is that if you look at all of the various relief acts, the poor acts, the, the various ones basically from 1880s to about 1906 that take place in Ireland, and by the way, these are much more advanced than what you see in an English context, what you see is that these are oriented towards rural environments. Conditions in the urban context of Dublin and these other places were absolutely horrific in comparison. So all the national acts attempting to uh, deal with social problems of, of health and crowding with the underprivileged, those are largely oriented in a rural context. And I think there's just this interpretation of that and a sense of the urgency. And in some ways, probably the, you know, the legacy of the, the initial famine and the sense of the, the kind of urgency in a rural context where you had not only people who were dispossessed, but people who literally had nothing. So I, I would imagine part of it was just the sense of this is the right fit for this particular group of people 
Uh, but there's, there's some other interesting dimensions coming back to the issue of identity and the issue of, of how they were viewed by the national government, how they were viewed by, by Tuk. Um, there's, a, there's an awful lot more that, that needs to be explored with that. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? <clears throat> well, I want to uh, thank our panelists. Um, they have worked very hard. Uh, weeks in advance in one case, coming off a leave who could have been somewhere else in another case. And uh, all of them, I think, have uh, uh, illustrated the kind of um, wonderful commitment and service that all Notre Dame faculty is famous for. So thank you all so much. And of course, thank you for your support and for being here. And we'll see you at the movies.